Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Semaphore Uncut, a podcast for developers about building great products. In this new episode, Darko, the podcast host, welcomes DevRel Jeremy Mees. Jeremy shares his experience in DevRel and insights into the transformative power and significance of community building and communication strategies. I hope you enjoy this new episode, and let's dive in. So today with us, we have Jeremy Meese. Jeremy, can you please just go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I am Jeremy Meese. I most recently was head of DevRel and community director over there at Circle CI. I've been in the DevRel space for pretty much almost 15 years. Companies like Solace and Auth0, done done a lot of consulting, done a lot of, you know, in that in that space as well, working with a lot of different communities. And then uh, I've spent a total of about 30 years in tech. I was doing DevOps in in 1995 at an internet provider, what we called now DevOps, but back then we just called it like sysadmin or network admin and those things. Uh, and then, you know, I've done everything from system admin to databases, to web, to application development, to project management, just probably just about everything. In fact, I was even doing, you know, I think about dev developer relations. I was even doing DevRel at, at a company I worked at, uh, Hallmark Cards, which does a lot of, uh, you know, greeting cards and stuff. Back in 1999, I was what they called a technical liaison, which basically was internal developer relation. We have recently launched a CICD learning tool, which shortcuts into everything you need to know to level up your CICD process and increase your productivity. Also, to ensure that all our customers get the best CICD guidance, we have improved our signup process. From now on, everyone who's considering using Semaphore will get personalized CICD expert guidance from day one. Our engineers have more than 10 years of experience, so you'll surely be in good hands. Check it out on our website, semaphoreci.com. I had quite a few guests who had those like, you know, as you said, 30, 40 or so years in the tech industry. I'm now recognizing the, the eras, you know, or, you know, milestones through your career. And you are, uh, you're closely approaching that time where you should write the book. <laughs> uh, don't tell me that because I keep that, that comes to mind. And then I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. And then someone else says, you know, you should write a book. Cause I, you know, say something and I'm like, ah, so, uh, ah, no. I spoke with a, a lot of several people recently. It just happened to be the case. And um, you seem to be one of one of the people who have most experience in this particular role. As you said, you know, 15 years or so. So you should be one of the guys who really remember the really beginnings of formation of that role. Can you speak a, a bit about that? How do you see that part of the history of that that becoming? Or because it wasn't always. Yeah, it was. It's gone through. Uh, it's gone through a lot of, of change over, especially over the last few years. But but it dates back. I mean, you, you start looking at kind of the etymology of the role. It exists. It existed even back in, in like 1994, 95, actually, at there was like Netscape, who, you know, did the first kind of big uh, browser. Mozilla was also kind of around that time, but they had a, a role, a director of developer relations, uh, Donna Simonides, I believe was the name. And so it was, you know, so they even had had a role and that that whole role actually was to work with developers on how to build websites for Netscape. Then, you know, even Microsoft had a, a VP of DevRel and marketing back in, in 97. Apple had their own uh, before even Steve Jobs came back. And, and they even called it uh, the chief contact with the development community. Like that's, that was their, they understood like the developers were important. And install shield, if we think about, you know, the, the old, I guess it's still probably around. I used it you know, back in the 90s, but creating these install ap applications to install software, they had a DevRel team in, you know, 1998. So that it started back then, but, uh, you know, Sun had their own as well. But when we think about like modern DevRel, the, I, this idea of having like multiple advocates and at the time it was called developer evangelists because you're about spreading the good news about whatever the product was. Twilio, Engine Yard, Twilio and Engine Yard are pretty much 
kind of the beginnings of what we kind of start to see this in the SaaS kind of environment. But neither of neither of those companies actually still do DevRel in the same way as they did then, because it's it's supposed to change. It's supposed to be like uh, kind of fit the mold of whatever the company is doing, whatever the company's product is, who the customer is, like all those different things. So it has its origins back in in a, a time when you know, especially the internet itself was just exploding. So it's it's gone through gone through a lot. And you were mentioning some changes in the recent years. Can you maybe sp- speak a bit about how do you see those changes that uh, we have seen recently? I think as, as the modern kind of company has kind of kind of changed a lot, you've started to see a lot more, you know, product, you things like product driven growth. And you got, you know, community led growth and you have sales led. all these different kind of times that a company goes through is probably a lot more defined now than it was then. And we started to see a lot more segments of like business to developer, business to consumer and business to business, like all these different kind of verticals are starting to kind of pop up a whole lot more now than, you know, they even were 25 years ago. And so the roles have what developer relations entails now is a lot broader, I think. I think we've seen a lot more like developer experience has become a term, a department, uh, you know, an organization where before that really just kind of was just something you did. And so we've seen that the role of for like developer relations have to kind of bring up new different roles to respond to the business. The business has understood uh, the community is important. Some understand that better than others. Some understand that it's a long tail play. Others think that they can, you know, build a community in three months and then they don't understand why that's not working. Some try to siphon as much money out of it. Like there's there's different ways a company goes after it, but there's been that understanding of, okay, you know, community and developers is, is important. I think companies have started to understand more and more the importance of of getting in front of them and so the the role for developer relations i think just has has been a lot more diverse than it has been in the past and and i think there's a lot of mis misrepresented ways that developer re, like relations itself so you know developer advocacy or developer community that kind of thing gets portrayed there's been a lot of companies and a lot of people that have tried to um, have presented it in, in a way that probably is a lot more self-serving than it's supposed to be. And so I think it's it goes through a lot of different uh, growing pains, I guess is probably a good way to put it. So if, Did I catch correctly that uh, one of your first roles in the late 90s was actually in Word Facing, where you were supporting the internal organization? Yes, it was kind of an interesting thing. At the company I worked at, uh, Hallmark Cards, they were, you know, I'd started doing a lot more interfacing between, you know, like the salespeople that were selling, selling the cards and the systems that they had to use in order to do that. And the people who were actually building those systems, so the IT and the, the consumer, the customer, essentially, internal customers uh, and internal developers, and started finding myself being that person that just kept being said, hey, can you go explain the technical thing to the non-technical people? And then can you tell the tell us what the non-technical people are trying to say, because we don't we don't speak the same language. And it was, you know, what we would call now kind of internal developer relations, which back then we didn't even we didn't really think about it that way. But you do see internal DevRel at a lot of companies today, primarily as, as they, I'd, I'd say it's primarily at larger companies that have a lot of internally developed tools that they need people to be using, but that not everybody knows What's there? You know, might have 10,000 developers and you, you know, they don't know that they're supposed to be able to use X tool that's been created to streamline this other process they do. And so those, uh, you see a lot of internal DevRel teams that have popped up a lot of kind of uh, probably work pretty closely with like platform teams as well of just trying to help. You know, people understand how to use and build an internal community of developers for a product. So we see we see that kind of come up as well. I'm curious to hear what's the thing that really attracted you to the role and what are the elements of it that you really love, obviously, as you seem very passionate about it. I kind of kind of backed myself into it or or kind of I guess that's probably a good way to say it. I uh, kind of stumbled into it. I was working kind of full time at Sprint and was started using, um, you know, got this new device. Uh, it was an Android device. Started seeing something wasn't working, and so I, you know, went to go find out why, and then found found a community that, of people that were talking about 
that. And so got involved in that and started to see how that kind of grew and, and that community itself was growing and, and got more and more involved in that. And then started helping out the community. I started doing some moderation and stuff all while I was working full time. And then kind of got asked to or, or volunteered uh, or voluntold, I guess, is, depends on how you want to say it, to start kind of being an admin, somebody that kind of was a leader more in the community because of the things I was doing and helping build in, in, in both internally to the community and, and externally, and then kind of stepped into a role, saw a need of working. You had a lot of open source things happening, but there was not uh, anyone really talking to the companies that were cre- that were creating these devices. I said, I'd, I'll do it. And so I started actually doing what, what became a role called OEM relations, but I was really just helping, basically it was developer relations. I was helping Samsung and Sony and HTC and other companies understand how to work with the developer community. And then how does the developer community work with the OEMs? And so, do, you know, start diving into all of that and understanding, like advocating for both and what it meant. And I don't know where I found it, but I, I happened to see some term developer relations. I'm like, oh, it kind of sounds like what I'm doing. And I searched and found a community of developer developer advocates and said, hey, I'd love to join that. I joined that, that community. And and then started to see, hey, there's this role that essentially was what I was already doing on the side. And so dove deeper and then said, you know, what? I would love to do this. And so I actually started getting paid by the company uh, and then started a company to do some of that as well as some development. And, and it just kind of developed into, it's like, this is what I want to do. We have recently launched a CICD learning tool which shortcuts into everything you need to know to level up your CICD process and increase your productivity. Also, to ensure that all our customers get the best CICD guidance, we have improved our sign-up process. From now on, everyone who's considering using Semaphore will get personalized CICD expert guidance from day one. Our engineers have more than 10 years of experience, so you'll surely be in good hands. Check it out on our website, semaphoreci.com. It really feels, in my engineering terms, to put it, the common denominator is communication in various forms, uh, various forms, either to, a, as you said, a company or a community of people. And then when you think about developer advocacy itself as kind of like a role, like developer advocates, that's, that's a typical role. Being able to have empathy, you know, really kind of feel and understand what somebody is experiencing is, an, is, is like a big part of the role. And so that does require that you have at least some technical background to be able to understand some of that. But that doesn't mean you need to be have been developing in any kind of platform for 20 years or it doesn't it doesn't mean that as much as at least have been doing some type of a role like that that you're able to really understand and be able to take back what their experience is and accurately communicate it to the product teams and to marketing, you know, whatever those are, it doesn't mean that just because you're a developer that, hey, you can go do a developer advocate, nor does it mean that you're a developer advocate, you can just go be a big engineer. It, and so it's, it, it, is a, it is a good path for a lot of engineers and a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of solution engineers move into developer advocacy because they already understand a lot of the pain points. They understand, you know, product, they understand communicating, sharing demos, those types of things. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to get into it, but I think the, at the core of it, you've got to have that empathy that comes from having done the role in some, some way. And that also seemed to be a role that could be like a stepping stone towards working with a larger community outside in the world versus the community within the organization. Yeah, for sure. What are your thoughts on a forum with, you know, thousands of people without faces versus in-person community and all of that? I mean, being good at both is... Uh, not easy. At least that's what why my brain is telling me. What are your thoughts on that? You know, there have been developer conferences for decades, like, but for the most part, they weren't. You know, they definitely were not as as often or you know as widespread as we see them now. And so those connecting points definitely were online. You just kind of had to found, find them, and they weren't generally. I don't know that I could think of one that was really kind of around a product. I mean, every company started to have like hey, here's our support forum or support question and answer thing, but it wasn't really like a community Usually technology was usually, you know, the language or the framework was kind of a natural gathering point. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Uh, And we still see that today. 
the challenge when you're kind of working with, uh, you know, trying to trying to do the in-person and the offline kind of, or the online and offline kind of uh, thing is that each have different needs because people still desire a, a face-to-face interaction. As, as that has changed, it is still important for companies to have some type of a online engagement. Forums are great for that because they live on and they're searchable. Chat like Discord or Slack is also good because it's kind of that real time, hey, I'm having this problem now. But the problem with those is that you can't search those and you have to go extra effort to join them in order to get involved. So you have to install a software package and then you have to figure out a username and password, all that. But with a forum, you don't even have to log on just to find the answer. It's like Stack Overflow. Like you don't have to log on to Stack Overflow to find the answer. Community and working with developer relations is going to where your users are. And so if they are in a lot of these forums, you should be too. If they are going to these meetups, you should be too. Like that and finding what are the other, those different companies that you integrate with, your developer relations and community teams should be doing things with those companies as well, because you can, uh, you know, more people raise up both communities. We started doing, you know, the, the, the physical events before COVID and then had that, you know, huge job. And then just recently, maybe a year ago, started, uh, you know, rebooting the, the physical events from literally, you know, a, a small meetups to something bigger. And I kind of, uh, again, from scratch, you know, experienced that, that just that in-person contact and all those other things that happen along the way, walking from the event home and, you know, grabbing a piece of pizza and then actually having the most productive conversation actually <laughs> somewhere on the street versus the that focus time that, that you have at the, at the event. It, there's just another another level. One of the core tenets of developer relations is, is like feedback loops. That's one of, you should, you know, you should be able to gather the feedback from the developers and bring that to back to the company. It's rare to see that actually happen very well. Um, and a lot of that is because it it's very, it takes on different forms for whatever the product team is wanting, which is important for you know, DevRel to talk to the product teams and find out the info that they need and then go out and have that face-to-face conversation. And it's a whole lot, when you're having that face-to-face conversation, it's a whole lot harder to hide behind a keyboard and say, you know, whatever you want. There's a certain level of vulnerability on both sides that's good. I've seen much more actionable and valuable feedback in those face-to-face conversations. But what developer relations is able to do in those conversations, like you've said, of like, it could be at a coffee, over coffee, or the hallway track at a conference, is taking that and in capturing that person, what they're experiencing, who they, you know, the name, the company they work for, what are the challenges that they have? What do they like? What do they not? Capturing all of that and then bringing that back to product with that name and company, all of a sudden it's a person, you've humanized that feedback and it's a whole lot harder to dismiss that feedback when there's a person tied to it. They have the potential to to be the closest to the users of the product than anyone else. And so that they need to be bringing that real actionable feedback. Any pointers, hints to, you know, materials, communities that you can give to people who are either already in the in the DevRel world uh, and want to expand? And I also want to ask something that, that we touched upon in the prep part is post uh, you know, DevRel career was potentially beyond? So to answer the first question, I think the, you know, to kind of expand and, and look at what's, what you can kind of continue to work on and, and improve, always be asking questions. If you're talking with a customer, always get deeper uh, if you can. Capture that, track it, bring it back. Like that's, that's the things that can help show your value within not only your team, but also within the company. You know, a lot of people say, well, you can't track things with the de- developer relations. That's that's completely false and you need to or else you're going to struggle. And so it's it's really understanding, you know, dive into, talk to other areas of the company, find out what are they, what are their needs? What are they struggling with? What are they trying to get that? And, and you, I guarantee you will find something that you can say, oh, I could help you out with this at a conference or I could help by asking a developer I know this or you can 
you could probably find at least one thing from that conversation that you and your team, you know, or, or just even just yourself within your developer relations and developer community stuff that you could help them with. And when you do that, keep track of that. Make sure you talk about it. Be your, you know, be your own advocate as well, not just for the company, but for yourself. That's one big piece of advice I think I, I would give. In terms of like what's next for a lot of people that, you know, move in, come into developer relations. And then because some companies don't have great ladders kind of put in place for how you can move through it, eventually you kind of reach a spot where, okay, maybe I need to pivot and do something different. I see a lot of people move into like product because they've spent so much time working with the people that are actually using products that they have a lot of really good insight uh, and thoughts around how to how to build products uh, and how to really manage those and, and bring those to, you know, the go to market kind of mindset. I've seen a lot of people move into product. I've even seen a lot of people move into solution engineering because it's it's kind of a good mix of talking to people and also building things and being, you know, and there's also in some cases, there's some structure where you, know, you can get a little bit more benefit from building uh, solutions than, you know, just for a customer that you can maybe use for others. But there's a it's a it's a little more one to one opportunity to kind of build a little bit more specific instead of like a broader audience. So I've seen a lot of people do do that. And even kind of a sidestep of like product marketing is also an area that I've seen a lot of people kind of make that little sidestep into because there's a, the voice of the developer and you're able to communicate that, that vision. You have a really good way of uh, opportunity to kind of translate that into, you know, maybe you need to work on, help the message a lot more. Amazing. Yeah. I'm just going to tease you about the book. So maybe next time we, we'd speak, you'll be presenting maybe, the book. Maybe we'll be talking about a book. Uh, <laughs> Goodness, now I, uh, no. Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, super interesting uh, conversation. Yeah, same, Darko. It was great. Great talk with you and, and good job. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to Semaphore Uncut on your podcast player of choice so that you don't miss our new episodes. And stay tuned.